Morning, church. You know something? I love Sunday mornings. Sunday mornings have always been my favorite time of the week. I want to welcome you to service today. I want you to know that uh, you're going to have some good worship today and a really good message by Jag. It's really going to change your life, I promise you that. Um, before I go into the announcements today, let me remind you that uh, a few weeks ago, I sent you an email that we invited every member of the church to get involved in the Right Now Media. We, su- we subscribe to that for your household. You can watch any kind of video you want to on there. There's things for your children. There's things for men's groups. There's things for women. You name it, it's on there. So please take advantage of that right now media. Enjoy some good videos, some good Bible studies. It's all there. Well, this Tuesday night, it's going to be a prayer meeting. Every se- 7 o'clock, every Tuesday night, just jump on the website, cscc family.org, and it's right there. You just Click the link, and you're right in prayer meeting. Every Thursday night, as you know, it's our Bible study. We are right now going through the seven deadly sins. Man, are we having a really good time. The other thing I want to remind you of is, to actually tell you, is that I got an exciting announcement for you. On May 9th, which is Mother's Day, we're going to have an outdoor service. We're going to invite you to come into the, onto the property. We're going to set the chairs out for you. All you have to do is come, bring a mask, you know. We're going to hang out together on the lawn. We're going to worship t- together. We're going to let the worship music go into the airways of Roselle. And we're going to hang out together. Um, and so please don't miss that. All right, I think that's it. Oh, the last thing is thank you again for your faithful giving, tithes, and offerings during this season of time. Jump on the website. You can give there by Zelle or PayPal or send it in through the mail if you'd like or drop it off at the daycare during the week. God bless you guys. Have an incredible day.
welcome. So happy that you have tuned in, whether you're tuning in live or you're tuning in later. We're so happy to have you on with us. Um, so let's take this time together to pray because I'm confident and I'm sure that because you are here, the Lord has something very special for you, an invitation for you, a question for you to draw you closer to him, whether you know him, whether you've been knowing him, whether it's just like an on and off relationship, whatever it is, you are in the right place. So God, we thank you. <clears throat> we thank you that no matter where we are in our walk with you, the invitation is always to come closer to you. We thank you that you meet us exactly where we are. And so for every single person who's tuning in right now, who is listening to the sound of my voice, Lord, I know, I know that you have something so special for them. And I pray that they would not miss what you have for them today. Lord, I pray against any distractions, any worries, any fears, anything that may stand as an obstacle from them drawing closer to you, that they would melt away in your presence. We thank you for your presence, Lord, your precious presence that leaves us transformed, that leaves us looking more like you. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling mm. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling Are you hurting? Yes Are you hurting and broken? Overwhelmed, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling, he's calling you. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Come and get refreshed today. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Oh, come to it, oh, come to it. He won't reject you, He won't reject you. Arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He won't reject you. He won't reject you. Yes. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling leave behind leave behind your regrets and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrow bring your pain Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows today. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling, yes, oh, come to, yes, the altar, the Father's arms are, he's waiting for you, forgiveness was born with the precious 
precious blood. Oh, come to the altar, the altar, the Father's arms are. He doesn't care what you've done. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you with open arms. Yes. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. Yes. Oh, what a say. Forgiveness was bought with blood of Jesus Christ. Forgive. This is for you. If only you would believe it. If you would only believe that He came and He died for us. Forgiveness was bought. I could earn 
I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. And all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Before I spoke a word, you were singing. so so good to me before i took a breath you breathed your life in me yes you did you have been so so kind to me Shadow, you won't light up 
mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear it out, coming after me. It's no, it's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear it out, coming after me. choose to love me back and he thought of you so he went through this entire plan of creation he went through this entire plan of creating the universe of creating the earth of separating the waters from the land from separating the sea to the sky designing every animal designing every plant all with you in mind and he knew that Adam and Eve would fall. And he knew that Satan would tempt. And he knew that it would cost Jesus everything. And yet, he said, no, I want that one. And I want them so much that I'm willing to create everything just so I can breathe life into them just so I can give them an opportunity to feel loved. When I was his foe, when I was messing things up and jacking things up, and when it may as well have been me holding the whip that put the lashes on Jesus' back, still his love fought for me. I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it but still day in and day out God gives himself away freely he gives good gifts he chooses to continue to breathe life when he doesn't have to at any point because he's God he can change his mind and say no more but every moment he chooses to press in to chase after you to leave the 99 not because the 99 don't matter but because the 99 are already with him so he will chase you down and his love is relentless it is overwhelming and it is reckless 
because only recklessness could lead a, the God of heaven to come down to earth, take the form of a man, go through human trials to the point where he was in anguish and sweating blood because it was just too much to bear the idea of what he would have to go through. And yet and still, the Father's will be done and not his because that love nailed him to the cross. That love kept him on the cross when people were calling out, if you're really the son of God, then get yourself down. He could have, he could have, but instead he cried out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then he went and took the keys of death and hell and then he rose again because he needed us to know that he would fulfill his promises. And then he said, it's better for you that I leave and I'll send a helper and the Holy Spirit came to dwell within us. There is not a moment that God has left us abandoned. He has been intentional in building to this place where he literally dwells within us at every moment, chasing us down. Even when we're in our darkest places, even when we don't want to feel loved, still his love fights for you. There is no shadow that he won't light up, no mountain that he won't climb up to come after you. And it's interesting because he's God, right? So he can tell the mountain to move and it will move but if he'll go the extra mile to come after you, to chase after you relentlessly. So if you find yourself in that place where you've been running and you are hurting and broken within and overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, know that Jesus is hotly pursuing you today. God is hotly pursuing you today. He has stopped everything for this moment to call you by name, to say, my eye was always on you. You were always on my heart and I won't stop chasing you. I won't stop pursuing you because my love for you is unending. There is nothing you can do to make me stop. So I would encourage you to just submit. Let him love you understand fully that no you can't earn it no you don't deserve it but understand to him that none of that matters all he wants is you allow yourself to be swept away by his love there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me hold me overwhelming never ending reckless love of god oh it chases me down fights till i'm found leaves the 99 and i couldn't earn it and i don't deserve it Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Into your arms, I'm drawing me. my only heart's desire. Let this be your response to his love. It's my only heart's desire.
to your arms will draw near again just to dwell with you lord that is our only heart's desire so cleanse us lord cleanse us with fire and purify our hearts and wrap us wrap us wrap us in your arms it is the safest place we could ever be as we sang that last song i saw a woman sitting on the floor in her living room leaning on her couch in between pillows and just crying and I really feel like the Lord needs you to know that he sees you he sees you and in this moment it's all about you so whatever that means whatever the Lord is prompting you to do do it quickly because he's with you his eye is on you and he has not forgotten you Father, I thank you for the intentionality with which you meet us exactly where we are, knowing exactly what we need, knowing exactly what's going on so long before we do, Father. I thank you that you are a mysterious God that we will never comprehend, a love that is so reckless that you yourself would descend and come down and love on us and be present with us. It's so far beyond our comprehension and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to serve a God that makes absolutely no logical sense because love has no logic. So Lord God, I pray that we would find ourselves lost in your mystery, lost in your love, submitted to your mercy and grace that make absolutely no earthly sense. And as we receive from you, Father, help us to freely give so that we can win souls for you so that we can help people walk in freedom and deliverance in the same love that we get to experience on an every moment basis, Father. I thank you again, God, for just you being so intentional with your love for us, that we were on your mind from before the beginning of time and will be on your mind through all of eternity because you are God alone. You are faithful to your word and you're far beyond anything we will ever comprehend. Prepare our hearts for the word, Lord God. Let it be transformative. Help us to look, sound, and smell more like Jesus. Father, we want to fully live crafted in your image, and that takes refinement. So we welcome the hands of the potter in our lives to shape us as you always intended. I love you, Lord, and I praise you. I give you all honor and praise because you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I thank you so much for speaking through the worship team, just the words that were spoken that connects to who you are, that connects the commitment that you have towards us, if you, had, if you were connected to those words, if that prophetic word was for you, know that that's how much God is committed to you. Each lyric sung is something saying of how God is committed to you. The fact that he allowed his life to be ended so that you will be able to connect with him. He is committed to you to the end. Listen, I want to add on to that, where a father allows his son to be crushed for you. That's how committed he is for you. And that alone is enough for everything. A couple of weeks ago, when my wife and I, we watched The Passion of the Christ, and... We were looking at this thing, and I'm like, I can't believe I'm watching this because I know what's coming. But as they're hitting him and beating him and whipping him, 
I'm, I'm wanting to get up and go into the movie and tell them to stop. That's enough. Yet he had the power to say, stop, that's enough. But yet love was keeping him going. That's how committed he is to us. And so those songs that we sung, him desiring us to come closer to him, I don't want you guys to take that lightly because that is a call from the lover of our souls. It's weird how God works. It really is. I mean, if you think about him allowing his son to die for us, there's no greater commitment. Like, you can sign a contract. You can put money down on something. You can do whatever. You can commit to family, but there is no greater commitment than dying for somebody. That's it. That's all you have. But yet Jesus showed, no, I got even more. He went beyond what we could naturally commit to and said, this is how committed I am to you. So he works in in different ways. And as we're in this journey right now, talking about the the mystery of the roadway, kind of trying to see God. Like last week, Pastor Art was just talking about, yo, you you, you can't figure him out. You can't can't make him like a formula to understand how God works. He he just works different from what we understand. And that's what we're going to continue talking about. It's just how, how different... He works. So today, I I can't help but think about the the classic joke. When I think about starting my message, I can't think about, um, help but think about the classic, two men walk in a bar, right? You know when you hear that, you're going to hear something. Like, a cat walks in a bar. Like, something's coming that you're about to hear. And, you know, one that's funny that I saw online, uh, actually my wife would like this because she's like a grammar person, and uh, Pastor Sharon, Bree, like, it, it was, it was kind of nerdy, so be ready. It says, the past, the present, and the future walk in a bar. It was tense. <laughs> It's so corny. That's, that's why I'm laughing. It's just, it's just so corny. It's like, oh, come on, please. But, you know, I think about that when I think about starting this message. And I want to say, a naked guy runs around town. Yep, a naked, butt-naked dude runs around town. And nope, it's not a joke. This actually happened. And yet God uses that to show us how he works differently in our lives. He used that moment in time to show us what, what we would need today. So I know it's, it's kind of like weird, like what are you talking about? But yes, a naked dude runs around town, go, like he's crazy, the dude is possessed or whatever. And I don't know what he's doing, he's, he's possessed, he's probably going around doing crazy things. And um, like I could imagine, Women with their children, like, oh, my goodness, like, all this stuff is out, right? And it's like, oh, block their eyes, like, oh, this is disgusting. I mean, the people got so tired of this guy, they took chains, locked him up, um, shackled him up, and yet somehow he incredible hawked that thing and just broke out. This, this, is, this is something that happened. It's, it's ridiculous. So if you're hearing this, it's like, what is going on? That's what the people are witnessing. This dude is crazy. Not only that, he doesn't live in his home. He lives near the tombs. And you would think, yo, what is going on with this guy? He's possessed. But yet God, again, uses it to show us something that we need to learn about how he works differently. So this this right here happened If you could turn to Luke 8, verse 26. And so I'm going to explain what happened with this guy. Jesus is just now finishing doing his thing where he does the miracle on the boat, where the storm is going crazy, the disciples are scared, and he he says, look, peace be still. Guys, why, why didn't you have enough faith? All that great stuff that Jesus did. And now, from that point, they're coming in, landed on the spot, and now I'm going to read to you 
what happened. So Luke 8, verse 26. Then they sailed to the country of Gerasenes, of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on the land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he wore no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it has seized him. He was kept under guard and bound in chains and shackled. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked, what is your name? And he said, legion, for many demons, many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him, let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat, this is Jesus, and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Man, that is a lot going on. And I love the story. I've heard it so many times before in my life, but when I read it last, one part really hit me. And this is what I'm going to get into about today, about how God uses things differently from what we're normally used to or what we would do. And here's the part that's key. Back in verse 37, then all the people of the surrounding countries, of surrounding country of the Gerasenes, Ask him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. You see what's crazy to me is that you guys know about this crazy the um, demon possessed man. You know for a while what he's been doing, crazy, naked, all of that stuff. Jesus comes in, heals him, has the demons come out of him, and the surrounding people, the surrounding cities say, yo, Jesus, leave. We don't want you here. What would cause them to do that? And Luke writes here and says it was fear. Fear seized them. Fear had a hold on them. And what I think is interesting is I want to talk about what caused them to respond that way, not to focus on the miracle, but to focus on the fact that Fear seized them, and maybe because they saw the pigs that that drowned. Like, I don't know what happened, but I know that there were two types of fear going on in there. So fear drew them away from Jesus. 
So much so that they didn't see the miracle. Now, when I think about fear, I was always thought to grow up and you got to have faith. The opposite of faith is fear, all, this, all these things like that. So what I would do and what you would think is like, I don't want to be like these people. I'm not going to fear. I'm going to avoid fear, have faith. But I want you guys to be careful because I had to learn within myself that that's not the right mindset. Avoid fear, have faith. Now, yes, we definitely want to have faith at all times as much as we can, as much as God gifts us with faith. But this avoid thing, I want to talk about that. So let's talk about fear. Fear is just fear. The thing about fear is what is two key things. Number one, where are you positioned when the fear comes? And number two, what are you doing with the fear? Now, I'm going to break down why those are two key things that God is showing us in this passage. So going back to verse 37, those are the people that told Jesus, yo, get out of here. I don't, we don't want you here. I don't know what you're doing or what you did with that. Get out of here. We don't want you here because fear sees them. They weren't the only group that had some type of fear in them. If you go back to verses later, verse 35, it says this. Then people went out to see what happened. They want to see what happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind. And here it is. And they were afraid. So we got two groups. Verse 37, people who were fe feared, they told Jesus, leave. But verse 35, that group of people, they were hungry enough to see what is God doing. And yet they were afraid when they saw and they learned about it. But that fear was a different fear, obviously. That fear was a fear that drew them to God. That fear was a fear that acknowledged that, wow, you are almighty. That fear showed revelation of like a, a, something about Jesus that they never experienced before. That fear drew them closer to Jesus, while the other fear of, with the other group in verse 37 drew them away. So my first point that I want to get on is where are you positioned when fear comes? Because fear will come. It's not about the feeling. It's about what we do with it. So my first thought is, where are you positioned when the fear comes? Why do I say, where are you positioned? Because if you look back at verse 37, then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them. These people who told Jesus, get out of here, we don't want you here, these people were, weren't even in the city. They weren't even around to see what happened. They weren't even connected with people who were there that experienced it. They had, they had nothing do, to do with the situation, but all they did was hear this, hear that, and they weren't even in the same area as Jesus. But yet, they said, when they heard about it, they said, nah, listen, Jesus, get out of here. I don't want you here or, or whatever. Now, you would think, like, yo, what is wrong with you people? You don't see the fact that he did a miracle? Like, you don't see the fact that he did something great? Like, for me, I, I was reading it, and I'm like, you guys are dumb. Like, what the heck is wrong with you? Like, are you serious? You really going to tell him to leave? What did they miss out on? Jesus made his way through a storm, stormy sea, to come over there. What did they miss out on that they told Jesus, leave? We don't want you here. And so for me, I'm like, yeah, that's terrible. I'm glad I'm not like those people. I'm glad I embraced Jesus. And then God caught me and said, are you sure you're not like that, Jack? Are you sure you're not like the people who told Jesus to leave? Are you sure you don't allow fear to seize you? So I had to check myself and think, like, wait, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about, like, how do we apply this to us today? Now, the second part about what fear can do is fear can mislabel what's really going on. 
And I want to talk about how mislabeling something, fear, mislabeling fear can cause damage. And this is how I can easily end up like those in verse 37, and I, I can reject Jesus and say, get away. So let me use this as an example. I'm up here right now. As I'm preparing for this message, this was a perfect example of God showing me my heart. As I'm preparing for this message, I'm thinking to myself, am I supposed to be speaking this message? I got a lot going on, man. I, I, maybe I'm not even supposed to be talking about this specific message. Or maybe I'm not even supposed to be the person speaking at this time. Maybe I need to speak at another time. Or maybe, God, you're not just flowing through me the right way. Or maybe I need to take a pause with preaching. Like, all these thoughts were going through my head, right? And the reason that was going through my head is God showed me my heart. He says, Jag, no, that's not what's going on. Jag, you're afraid. I'm like, I'm, I'm afraid. You have fear in you. And so he showed me why. So with this particular message that I'm bringing to you today, I, a couple of weeks ago, Bella um, was tested positive with COVID. So she had no symptoms. Thank God. Everything is great. She's fine now. But what happened was we, all, we had to quarantine. So during the day, I'm taking care of her, occupying her, while Tiff is able to work because she, she's not as flexible. And then when the evening comes, I got to do the work that I couldn't do in the morning. I got to do it in the evening. It was just, it was, seemed like nonstop, nonstop, but there was no time to myself to be able to sit and soak in God's word and, and just let it flow. All of that that I love to do. There was no time for that. So come Saturday, <laughs> the day before today, I'm here. I'm just like, okay, I am not where I usually am when I'm preparing. So then I start saying, oh, man, maybe this is not the mess. Maybe I should, maybe that. I'm labeling it all these other things. I'm mislabeling all these other things and not realizing that the core of it, the true label is, Jack, you have fear. So the thing is, it's not about me having fear and all of a sudden I'm a terrible child of God. That's not how Jesus works. He wants us to be able to give up that fear. He doesn't want us to mislabel it because on this journey, listen, we are going to go through things. On this journey, the Holy Spirit is going to prompt us to do things that are not normal that, I, well, I would have done it this way. Why are you telling me to do this? It's, it's uncertain. Like, what's going on? But he's going to use those moments to draw out of us things that he wants us to see. He already knows it's in there. And one of those things, for example, here was pulling fear out of me so that he can address it. Because as long as I keep it held into myself, as long as I mislabel it, he won't be able to address it for me to see. So that's a little example. Let's get to something a little more dangerous with mislabeling fear. I was reading a book uh, about racism, and there was a dope quote in there. And that quote, it said, the loveliest trick of the devil is to persuade you to think he doesn't exist. The loveliest trick of the devil is to persuade you to think he doesn't exist. Why is that important? It's a mislabel. It's saying, oh, there's no devil, right? So this book was talking about racism and saying, like, people, those who try to make it seem like, yo, racism doesn't exist. But this is talking about how the enemy loves to mislabel things. Why? Because then it tells us that we don't have to fight back on what he's doing. We're not going to work against him. In fact, we'll start believing lies from him. So I'm going to give one uh, other example of how the enemy wants things mislabeled. So here's an example. I purchased something online that was a bit expensive, a little more expensive than I was comfortable with, but I, I got it anyway, right? And so 
immediately. Give me the tracking number. I got an app. It'll show me where it is in the whole United States, and it'll track it and everything. I love it. So the day comes where it says, oh, okay, it's going to arrive today. So I'm excited. I'm like, all right, I'm ready to go. I come home, and it's, it's being tracked from UP, USPS, the post office. I come home, and I see this little tiny box. I'm like, what I purchased, uh, that doesn't fit in this box. Like, what's going on? So I pick up the box. It says USPS, and I'm, I'm like, all right, the phone says I'm getting something today. Okay, why would, why would USPS come twice? Okay, it was for Tiffany. So I'm like, all right, here's the box. Where, where's my stuff? <laughs> I, want, I want to know where my thing is at. So I was in the car in front of, in front of our house, and I was on a call with, with my mentor, and we were just talking, and I get a, a ping on my phone saying it's delivered. What's delivered? My package was delivered. And it does this, this app does like, yay, it's delivered. And I'm not feeling like, yay. I'm like, I don't see any USPS truck coming to deliver a package. I look at the steps while I'm on the phone, and the, the, guy, the guy's talking to me, like pouring into me. I'm like, yeah, 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 oh, sure. Like, where's my package? So I start freaking out. I'm like, was it, was it delivered somewhere else? Or does somebody have my package? Did it not come? Da -da 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 -da. All of that is going through my mind. And, I, man, I'm not even, like, paying attention on the phone. I'm, I'm disengaged, and I'm trying to focus. I'm like, listen, I need to... I need to focus. You can't do anything about this right now. You'll call USPS. So I, I call them after, and I say, I, nobody gets on the phone. I got to dial in the tracking number. And then after I dial the tracking number, it says, oh, it's in another city. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's in another city. Yo, this thing is expensive. And then right after they say it's in this city, they say, well, but you could pick it up in this city. I'm like, yo, I'm done. What is going on right now? Why did it have to be this package? Why can it be like a bill from like a company, like a utility bill? Like, why did it have to be this package? Uh, so next day, I go to USPS. I say, yo, this is what's going on. Where's my package? Da, 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 da. The lady says, oh, let me take a look at this. Oh, this, okay, I don't really think your package was meant to be delivered yesterday. And I don't think it was delivered anywhere. I think it's going to go out and be delivered today. So eventually it was delivered that day. But here, like, think about what just happened. I was using a tool to help with my reality, to know where something was in my life, right, to know the status. But this tool, somebody, she, she, the lady was like, yeah, somebody was lazy. They must have scanned something, and it just said that it was coming, and it wasn't really. And think about it. That wasn't the truth. Now, let's go back to the enemy. He uses lies for us to believe so that we can change the reality. I got frustrated. I got angry. I got concerned. For what? For no reason, because someone lied. And that is exactly what the enemy does. He mislabels things so that he can make, change our reality to something that's not of God, to an experience that God wants us to experience something totally different from what we're experiencing at that moment where fear kicks in, where we believe the lie. And so why that's so dangerous is that we won't be able to see how the enemy is working on this roadway that we're on, on the things that God is already trying to move us in a direction that is already mysterious, that is different from the norm. And now the enemy is trying to come in and give us lies and, and change our mind. So what does God want us to do? What does God want us to do when fear kicks in? We already know we got to position ourselves close to him. And we already know that we can't mislabel the fear. What does he desire? He desires this. I don't know if you guys remember or some of you may have heard of how Jesus fed 5,000 plus people with only five loaves of bread and two fish. If you haven't heard the story before, let me just do a brief summary. So the disciple, Jesus is preaching to like 5,000 men, not even including the women or kids. So a bunch of people, and it's getting late. 
And the disciples come up to him and say, listen, we got we to gotta tell these guys to go because we're far away from the land and they're going to get hungry. And Jesus is like, you feed them. I'm like, I, I, if I were the disciple, I would have been mad. Like, Jesus, you already know we don't have enough food to feed them and we're not going to go all the way that far. Like, what are you saying, Jesus? It's like, you feed them. And so Jesus says, all right. Go find out what's out there. So they go. They see this one boy who had five loaves of bread and two fish. So they get it. It's like, listen, this is all we got. Jesus then multiplies it, feeds everybody, and still has more left over. That's crazy. Now, let's let's rewind because I don't want you to miss this. This is what God wants us to do on a daily basis. The boy I want you to focus on the boy who had the five loaves and fish. What if the boy was like, hold up, the disciple comes like, hey, you got anything? I'm like, I got five loaves and two fish. Wait, hold on, hold on, (laughs) hold up. I did my part. I prepared. Like, I brought, I did my part. I brought the food. I knew we were going far, and I'm hungry, and you want to take my food for 5,000-plus people? Like, are you crazy? No. Like, what am I going to lose out on? What am I going to miss out on? Like, I'm not going to be able to eat. So he could have easily been like, nah, I'm, I'm good. Like, he would have been certain to know that I can eat. He never heard somebody say, yo, Jesus, yo, one time he took all this food and multiplied it. Some dude gave him it. You could do the same. He didn't hear that. He didn't experience that at all, but he actually gave it up. But I always wonder, what if, what if I was in that scenario? I would have been like, uh, I, 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 am I going to lose my food or <laughs> am I not going to eat? Now let's go back to the naked, demon-possessed guy. Think about the people who told Jesus to leave, rejected, right? They might have mislabeled Jesus as a sorcerer. And because they labeled him something he's not, their reality changed. This young boy who had five loaves, two fish, decided to not label the situation off of fear of losing or missing out. He decided to give it up to Jesus and allow Jesus to work with it. Now think about it. For me in my personal life, I have fears. I know a bunch of you have fears too. I have fears. I'm going to be straight up. One of my fears is that God is calling me to do things that require me to, to go full-blown, but I am afraid. I fear him not, not taking care of me. I fear him not providing for me. I fear, uh, I don't know, us, us not having the things we want. Like, I fear those things, and I'm being straight up. Not trying to sound like I'm this tough spirit. Well, man, I'm going to go into the fire and nothing's going to hurt me. I'm not going to act like that. But I fear that. So I say that to to God. I, I tell him honestly, and he's like, you know what? Thank you for that. Thank you for those five loaves and two fish. And you're like, wait, what are you talking about? Because what the five loaves and two fish represent is God saying, just give me what you have even if it's being afraid. Allow me to take it and bless it and convert it to something that draws you close to me. That's that's the whole point of this road way, is that we would draw close to him. Yeah, it's weird how he works, but he doesn't want you to allow fear to push you away from him. He wants you to give the fear to him so he can use it to draw you close to him. That's what he desires for us. And I'm trying to see, like, Lord, what, 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 what do you desire from me to make the next step? Just be honest with you and just tell you, I'm, I'm afraid. What, can you do something with this? Yeah, I got you. Just, just I want you to give it up to me. There is a verse in, the, in, in 1 John 6 where it talks about how perfect love casts out fear, Right? And I hope we all believe in that, but it takes us allowing the fear to surface up and give it up for God to do his work. But if we hold it to ourselves, we become self-reliant, and then we begin to say, Jesus, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you to step away. 
Let's not turn into that. Let's not let fear on this journey tell us to draw away from Jesus, even though we don't intend that. Let's allow fear to be given up to Jesus. Here, take this and convert it to intimacy. Isn't that weird? Like, how does God do that where he converts fear into intimacy, where he converts fear to, beginning, to being the beginning of wisdom, to knowing him? Like, he takes something that in, in our day we would think, like, yo, I have no fear in nothing, but he uses that. That's what amazes me about him. He doesn't work like we work. He doesn't do things like we would do things. One thing that really hits me when he talk, when I think about fear and how I want to avoid it or things like that with that mindset. Um, how many of you guys play Jenga? Is it Jenga or Jenga? Can somebody tell me? Jenga. I keep calling it Jenga. But Jenga, right? You got all these uh, wooden blocks or planks or whatever you want to call it. It's set up, right? And you, you're taking things out. That's the point of the game. And now if you were to take everything out from the bottom, right, it would eventually just crash because it has no support. So that one little thing, that one little, little wood piece can be taken out and destroy everything, right? Now, I say that to say this. This is how I treat, and some of you might feel the same way, how I treat moments in my life where I'm worried, where I fear not doing things right. I take a one moment and think that that one moment of a mistake or failure or fear will destroy everything God has for me. It's just going to plummet down. Eternity is not going to look the same for me. It's just going to destroy everything. And we laugh at that because we know that's not the case. But at that moment, we treat that moment like that's going to happen. Even though we don't in, uh, intentionally think that's going to happen, how we treat the moment, we're like, yo, this is going to destroy everything. And so why I bring this uh, metaphor up is for us to realize that, no, that's not how God works. And in those moments of being afraid, of fear, of, for me, like I said, like, is he going to provide for me, all of that, there's nothing that can be done that would destroy everything that God is trying to do in your life, that would destroy the commitment he has towards you. It's already been solid, one. He already championed it by when he died on the cross for you, for me. So it's locked in. Now it's just about living. He's not, he's so committed to you. There's no greater commitment out there. So we need to not look at this one moment in our life that can destroy everything. But we need to allow that moment to say, God, here, can you convert this into intimacy? Because I'm scared right now. Can you draw me close? I remember this one story about people who were captured, missionaries who were captured in a different country. And they, um, they had them there, and they were, like, killing people. And all they had was each other, and they were praying and quoting scripture. And they were so scared. But after they were rescued, after they came home and everything was cool, some of them would talk to each other like, Dang, I, I know we, we could have died and all, but don't you miss how close we were to God? I can't, I can't mimic that again. Isn't that weird? They were near death. They could have been killed, but that moment they allowed Jesus to convert it into intimacy that they, they can't even mimic again being back home in comfort. How, how do you do that, Lord? So the, the moments that fear can, can have its opportunity to hit us, don't run away from it. Don't mislabel it. Don't try to make it anything else, but just be real and say, I am scared right now. I have fear, but Father, can you take this, convert it into intimacy? so that I would draw close to you and receive what you have for me. Father, I, I love you so much. I thank you for who you are. I thank you that we don't get you. I think, thank you that we can discover you in new ways. Lord, help us not to look at situations that happened in the past where you are modeling something that you're trying to teach 
and assume that we're on the good side. I ask that you begin to reveal our hearts. Where is it that we push you away? Where in our lives do we push you away? Where in, in our home, in our body, like that we don't allow you to come into this room or that room? Where do we do that, Father? Open our eyes. For those who are listening, I want you to understand that he is so committed to you. I spoke about five loaves and two fish, but he wants you to hear this. There's no life that you can live. There's no sin or damage or, or evil or whatever thoughts you had or have done. There's nothing that you could have done that he can't take it and make it into something glorious. Those people, the disciples thought that you can't do anything with this, Jesus. It's five loaves and two fish, but yet he took it and made it out of something. He's saying that he could take wherever you are right now in your life, no matter what your past, and he can transform it into anything he desires as long as you're willing to take your life and say, here, like, I don't, I don't know what you could do with this, Jesus, but you said you can do something with it. And I just want to give it to you. If that's you, I'm asking you right now to know that he is so committed that he will take whatever you got if, as long as you're willing to give it to him. So right now I'm asking that if you want him to do that for you, if you want him to take whatever you've been through and make it into something beautiful, I'm asking you right now to say this and repeat after me. Father, be Lord, in my life. Father, I want an intimate relationship with you. And that's all he wants. He just wants you. Listen, there's nothing he needs in life. He is God, but he wants you. That's how committed he is to you. Listen, if, if you guys prayed that or if you need uh, guidance on this journey that we're on, we're talking about Roadway, just message us in, in our social media or email us on our website, whatever you need. We want to be able to provide and help however we can while you're on this journey trying to discover where is God taking you and how can he take my mess and convert it into something intimate. Thank you, guys. Uh, that was a whole lot to take in, a whole lot to chew on. So I really hope you guys take the time to digest, to revisit this message over and over, because there really is just so much here. There's always so much in the mystery of God. I'm going to try to keep this short and sweet, but again, there was a lot. The, the loaves and the fish... When Jag was saying, you know, his struggle would have been like, I prepared, this is mine, I don't want to lose my food. I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm going, mm, yeah, no, I'm kind of the opposite. Because for me, I'd be saying, but how could I ever have enough to give? There are so many people here. And either way, the lie is still the same to try to trap you in fear to keep you from moving. So you have to be intentional about identifying those things, those areas of weakness so God can use them for intimacy. And that is something that I truly, truly love that he said. Talking about the mystery of God's structure where he turns struggle and fear and anxiety and all of those things into intimacy. For me, that's a deep invitation to lean in and press into those things, which is so countercultural, which is so against our nature because we just want it to end, right? We just want to be at peace. We just want to feel okay. But none of that leads us closer to Jesus. When we lean into the discomfort, when we press in, when we acknowledge, when we accept, I'm scared, I'm this, I can then submit those things to the Lord to allow him to use them to draw me closer. And when he was talking about that moment where you feel like, one, you're powerful enough to really mess up what God has in store, you're not, um, but it can feel like that because in the moment we get caught up in looking at the wrong thing. And the moment that we take our attention away from the Lord is the moment we begin worshiping something other than him. We get caught up worshiping the moment and that will always set us up for failure. 
So again, we have to be intentional to say, I recognize this for what it is. It's a distraction. And I refuse to take my eyes off of him. And the last thing that I wanna say is, God works in mystery. The enemy works in manipulation. You have to identify the difference because that's what's going to help you to submit that fear to the Lord when you recognize for sure, this is not God's mystery. This is a manipulation from the enemy and a lie trying to draw me into fear. But now that I see it, I can acknowledge it, own it, and give it back to the Lord who has already taken it on the cross where it was already killed not to be resurrected with him. I hope you guys have a phenomenal week. And again, make sure you just spend some time really pressing in to see the areas of your life right now, where you are right now, that you can submit to the Lord so he can draw you closer in intimacy. I love you guys. Take care.